Tiffany's story with Living a Stressed Life. And we are here today um, to talk about a topic that I think a lot of people can relate to. And that's life after the life after divorce. The stress involved with transitioning from being married to finding yourself single again. Um, I'm short my co-host because the stress life is real and we are trying to transition out of our house and things just didn't go as planned. And so um, I am swinging it by myself as far as a host, but I have two lovely ladies, two guests I've gotten a chance to know personally um, on the show today. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Hi, it's Felicia. <laughs> Felicia. Daniels, I'm sorry. It's Felicia Daniels, hi. Felicia Daniels, we have Adrian Nixon. Adrian Nixon. And I want to give a little plug for Adrian. So, Adrian also has her own podcast that focuses on um, her life after divorce and her life, I guess. Yeah. It's called Hello Adrian. Tell us a little bit about your, your podcast. Um, Hello Adrian kind of was birthed out of my divorce in 2016. I found myself single for the first time ever after being married 19 years and it's just kind of the journey the things that I've gone through the questions that I've asked the things that I've encountered that I had no clue I would run into and pretty much how I'm building day by day so it's not just about divorce I do answer a lot of divorce questions but you know like last week I just posted a question and answer from my friend so it's a lot of life stuff mm -hmm. so um, and then like in a week or so I'll post the video I did like a whole vlog of my Chicago trip okay. so you know it's that kind of stuff but it just it really stemmed from wanting to have a place to talk about divorce because as black women we don't talk about it it's for whatever reason it's taboo mm -hmm. but I feel like if more people were transparent about the things that they've gone through then I mean it just helps somebody else yes thank you so, thank you thank you the quick version and so I'll I'll put this other little plug in there about Adrian Adrian is a seamstress fashion designer you every one of those ladies I I desire to be when I grow up she liked to cook I hate cooking I can cook I cook well <laughs> but I hate it okay she can cook she can sew I can sew a pillowcase, but you can take down cabinets and and put in countertops. That is stuff. true. I, I I'm, I'm, I I'm 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 handy. <laughs> I like shop when I was younger, and so she's one of those people who um, I say is uh, all. I don't want to say all American. Oh, that's not fun. She is a a, a well-rounded woman. You are a homemaker. You you a good good woman. That that eighty yes. ninety. Yes. Daniels is my everything. She is the <laughs> Like, parent of the year, class mom, attorney, um, girlfriend. We have known each other because our kids have gone to school together. Um, we've been in in each other's lives, standing in the gap. Hey, I need you to pick up my kid because I'm running late. Hold on to him <laughs> so I can get there to the PTA meeting. Yes. So, Dane, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am an attorney, as she just said, and... Um, what else is there? No, I've I've been divorced since 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a solo practitioner and I do um, business consulting, contract review. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said earlier, I'm getting ready to open up a business, fingers crossed, in October in Inslee. Um, it's going to hey, be a club on. slash restaurant trying to bring back the old school feel with Tuxedo Junction with a little new... So, um, trying to do a couple of things here and uh, finding myself. So, that's that's been the biggest thing for me. Yeah, so um, I slid in Felicia's DMs <laughs> because I felt like you had, I didn't know if you were separated or divorced. And I wanted to talk about this topic because I have someone um, that I've gotten quite fond of. Um, going through a hard time and it was just like you know what this is a topic like you said should be talked about um, I've listened to your podcast and some of the things you've shared about your journey and I was just like I want to be able to share this with listeners because although you talk about you truly talk about your life after divorce that's what your focus is on it's just life starting over finding yourself mine is all about stress um, I mean as a mental health clinician as someone who now works with homeless young ladies, 
doing outpatient work and as a mom and type A person, <laughs> okay, let's not forget that I'm type A. Um, I feel like stress is something that I'm constantly trying to manage. And so I was like, what else is more stressful than like starting over? So I'm going to start with um, something I came across on the internet. And it talks about um, it talks about divorce and the impact of divorce on families. Um, so let me share this. I am a child of divorce. My parents, when I was in about the fifth grade, they they got divorced, um, and then they remarried when I was in the seventh grade. But when that transition happened, um, and I've shared on the show openly before, my dad was a substance abuser. He struggled with um, addiction and alcoholism, pretty much the majority of his life there were good moments but there were also bad moments and unfortunately it led to him having health issues that caused him to die before he was 70 and so um the divorce between my parents had a lot to do with that it had a lot to do with my dad's struggle and journey with addiction and and its toll on my parents marriage and its toll on the household and um overall and i remember when my parents my mom sat me and my siblings down and told us that her and my dad was divorcing. I was, my mom remembers all of us having come apart, but I didn't remember that moment, moment like clear as day. And I remember my younger sister running down the hall. No, I actually, I got that mixed up. My mom also told me she, my mom had found out she was pregnant. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Right before, when I her and my parents were going through a divorce. She ended up having a miscarriage. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. But I remember the divorce conversation happening. And it, it didn't bother me. When her, when the news came out that our parents were divorcing, my sister was upset. My brother, um, both of my sisters were upset. My brother was upset. But I remember thinking, oh, man, I'm going to get a new mama. I'm going to get a new <laughs> baby. And I really wanted babies in our house. I, I was always in love with babies. And I remember going to school. I was in the fifth grade. And my best friend at the time had a stepdad she hated i mean she just absolutely hated her stepdad and she had a younger brother that um her mom had had by her stepdad and i was like my parents getting a divorce too girl i'm gonna get a new stepdaddy stepmom <laughs> she was like are you crazy she's like i hate my stepdaddy and it was like the first time like i think somebody busted my bubble like this could be ugly mm -hmm. um and when my parents began to work it out i remember a moment where we went to visit my dad when he moved back to Mississippi. That's where he was originally from. And I saw my parents kiss, you know, when they greeted each other. And I got so hopeful, like, oh, they still love each other. And then my cousin told me my dad had a girlfriend. Oh, wow. And we got into a fight, a physical altercation <laughs> behind him telling me. I was like, my daddy don't have no girlfriend. I just saw my daddy kiss my mama. He was like, your daddy do have a girlfriend. And I remember <laughs> saying some really mean stuff that resulted in a physical altercation <laughs> in the hospital. But... Those are really very distinct memories in my mind. And as I got older and then I talked to my sister about it, her experience on the other end was that our dad was abandoning us. Mm -hmm. Like we were in college and she was like, I remember trying to figure out if dad was leaving um, mom or if he was leaving us. She said, I thought he had left us, that he didn't love us anymore. Yeah. And here I am like 20 years old, we in a drive through of like KFC. And I'm looking at her like, really? Like, why did you think that? But that was, that was how she saw it. She was the baby, and it really impacted her. My sister went through a lot, um, even after my parents got back together. Just the impact of moving from California to Birmingham and then them getting divorced and my dad having addiction issues, it really took a toll on her, and I think I was just a little bit more resilient. And so, hence, that brings me to me understanding firsthand. So when I read this article, it talked about uh, basically that parent-child relationships decline drastically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. children change mm -hmm, drastically mm -hmm. and so I kind of wanted to talk to you ladies and and ask you really what was the biggest change that you noticed in your family dynamic when divorce happened um okay my kids are older so now they are now 17 19 and 23 mm -hmm. So this was just three years ago, so this is math. Mm -hmm. So um, my son was really, really nonchalant. And my middle daughter was middle daughter. 
I mean, and then my oldest daughter, middle child syndrome is real, let's just say that. <laughs> and my oldest daughter, she has this, you know, this facade of, I'm just strong, it don't matter. You know, so I have, I've learned to see through that. Mm -hmm. Now, my son was a little bit harder. He really didn't have his come apart until his thing was, Mama, as long as you're happy, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And his come apart wasn't really until, I want to say it was last summer. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking and he, he just like broke down cried. Mm -hmm. And we talked about a lot then, mm -hmm. you know, because there were, you know, there was just a situation behind my divorce. And I, I came to a point where I had to tell the children exactly what was going on because the rumors were worse than the truth. Mm -hmm. So I told them, I'm like, hey, listen, if you hear anything other than X, Y, and Z, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I, I had to because they were so upset with their dad. Now, it's not that I wanted to protect him, air quote, per se. It was that I wanted them to know, okay, this is just what happened. You know, people will spread rumors and all this stuff and when it's in a circle the way it was, it just, it, it was just worse. It was way worse. And they were building up all this anger and resentment that was really, it was just kind of, there were no grounds for it other than being towards upset. Him. Towards him. Mm -hmm. Other than like being upset about the actual divorce, which is understandable. But I didn't want them, you know, I didn't want them feeling that anger that it just, it wasn't called for, you know, just to be angry with him because of what people said that he did so do you think when you really set them down and and gave them the truth and I'm pretty sure you tried to make it as clean as possible yeah. and not the gritty version but when you sat down and you gave them the truth do you think it really made an impact do you think it helped them have less resentment or do you think at, to certain extent it somewhat validated some of the things that were brewing there that they probably saw but didn't recognize what they were seeing. Yeah, I think it, it just it helped validate some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because I had a conversation later and they were like, well, this is why this happened. So when this was going on, then this was going on. You know, mm -hmm. so they kind of start putting two and two together. And for, for a while, I wouldn't confirm or deny, mm -hmm. but then it got to the point where they were being specific. And I was like, well, yeah, this is what happened. And yes, this is what happened. But no, this didn't happen. So mm -hmm. I just kind of had to, I felt like it was best to handle it that way. That's interesting because, you know, I know in a lot of households, most parents try to shield their children from they, the adult stuff, right? So I don't think I really consider, I had older siblings, but I was younger. Mm -hmm. So I really couldn't tell you, me and my older siblings, because there's so much, like my older sister is like seven years older than me, and my brother, like I think 10. Like I, I, <laughs> I lost track of his age. I know he's 50 something, 50, mm -hmm. mm, 50. Maybe 50-ish. <laughs> I say I don't even know how old he is. I think he's 50. He might get mad if you listen to this. I don't know. But I think I never considered that perspective. I think about the impact when the kids are young and they're yeah. still in the identity formation mm -hmm. stage. And so I don't think I focused on that perspective that when they're older, they may ask questions that you're like, oh, girl, I don't know if I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. Or you're like, okay, I got to talk them about that yeah i just felt like it was it was necessary because mm -hmm. they were i mean when i tell you they were they were just pissed off yeah. i mean they were angry mm -hmm. but it was it was over a lie you yeah. know if you if you don't be mad be mad about the truth yeah so to me you know as parents it's often i don't owe you anything i'm growing you do as i say and not as i do mm -hmm. but i really felt like they needed to know i mean and it just you know and it, it made things better now the younger two yeah you know, I kind of smoothed it over, but my oldest daughter knew everything that had gone on. Yeah. But she's also, you know, 23 going on 46. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she knew a whole lot, a whole lot more about the whole situation. What about you, Daniel? Well, I had the kids with the identity. Um, two years ago, my oldest would have been 13. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My middle was 11. Mm -hmm. And my baby was 2. So my baby, she's clueless as to what's going mm -hmm. on because mm -hmm. it's just, hey, mom and dad are in the house. My 11-year-old boy, who is already a, what's the best way to describe him? 
He's very unique. He's super intelligent, but he wants to pretend like he's not. For a year, it was like, are you divorced? I didn't know you were divorced. When did you get divorced? No, son, it, it happened over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I never, I tried to protect him. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by protect them is I told my oldest, um, your dad and I are getting divorced. She said, why? Well, I don't want to tell you that because I don't want you to hate your father. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, what he did to me and what was done, and it was an unexcusable. Mm -hmm. One day I said, I'll tell you what happened, but today is not a good day because mm -hmm. I don't want you to hate your dad because he's still your dad. Mm -hmm. um, I said, but we have to separate. With me, she got angry at me. My oldest hated me, I know, for about four or five months. Mm -hmm. We were driving home. And one day she wouldn't talk to me. And I said, well, what's wrong with you? She said, it's your fault that daddy is leaving us. Wow. Mm. And I had to stop. I literally stopped in the middle of the road, parked the car, and said, it's not my fault. Know this much. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm not going to tell you what your dad did. Mm -hmm. When you get older, I'll explain it to you. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to tell you what your dad did. I said, but it's unexcusable because nobody should be treated that way. Mm -hmm. I said, just know. That I will always be here for you. You can be mad at me. You can stay mad at me. But I'm still going to be mama. I'm going to be here for you. And one day you'll realize. What really is going on? And, you'll see, and now that two years later. She's like oh daddy whatever. Mm -hmm. You know she's starting to see. She's seen things in the past two years. And she's like she has come to me and said. Mom I'm sorry I was mad at you. I now realize. He was doing things. Because mm -hmm. he still does certain things. Mm -hmm. And. I can understand why you did what you did, mm -hmm. and I want you to be happy. So it, it has taken her a couple of years for her to see it. She's a daddy's girl, mm -hmm. and so being a daddy's girl, of course, you know, it's right. all, I want to protect daddy, <laughs> and you're wrong, because you don't know what you're doing, but it, it has taken time with her. My son, I, I still don't know. Um, what happened with him was he went from this mature, quiet young man he almost reverted to a baby-like stage for a while. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like he was seeking attention from me. Mm -hmm. And so, and he still does it from time to time. He'll just come and hug on me. Mm -hmm. Or he'll come lay on me. Or he'll just come in my room and lay in my bed. And I'm like, son, what are you doing? He's like, nothing. I just want to be close to you. So it's, there's certain things that have happened between those two, my older two, that um, though I didn't say the reasoning why their dad and I separated, it affected them differently. Where Zoe, uh, my oldest got mad. My middle, he became a, a, a baby. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to be up under me all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much to protect me. It was almost like he wanted that nurturing feeling again that he had when everything was, was perfect. Together. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now he's starting to see because he's about he's thirteen, getting ready to be fourteen, and so he's going through puberty. So he's starting to see things. And so, you know, I'll say things to him like, you know, you are the man of the house. And he'd be like, yes, ma'am, I know. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, he'll want to be baby again. And I have to remind him, you, you're 14, son. You're mm -hmm. grown. Your clothes smell. <laughs> <laughs> you don't bathe every day. You know, get from under me. But yeah, they, they, they flipped on me for a minute. And it was hard on me because emotionally I was already drained from the mm -hmm. divorce. Because it was like I went from having the life to having absolutely nothing. I mean, it was it was so bad that my family was like, why are you divorcing? Mm -hmm. Don't do that. And that's to kind of come back on what you said. We don't talk about divorcing blacks because right. it's taboo. Because we get that, well, your, board, your, your vow said for better or for worse. And the Lord put you together, you need to stay together. Mm -hmm. We as a black community kind of keep this, keep this happening. We perpetuate um, cheating. We perpetuate abuse. A man is gonna be a man. Yes, and we and we and we, and we kind of expect the woman to stay there and take it because then you'll hear, because in my mom's case, your dad did it to me, and I stayed. Mm -hmm. So you should stay, mm -hmm. because you know they're gonna do what they do. But if you forgive him and if the Lord blesses you and you work it out, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna stay here because if he did it once, he's gonna do it again. It's interesting that you say that because I was looking or reading something and it was talking about how today some women feel pressured to get divorced when they find out their husbands have stepped out on them because there's so much judgment about being a stepping stool or you you stupid for staying with a uh, with a man who 
you know, stepping out on you or telling you that he's not faithful to you. And then they want to work it out because the relationship, they, they know it may have been something underlying that may have pushed them that direction and they get divorced for that reason. So um, it's interesting to hear your perspective because I feel like in most cases, and it may be a cultural difference, um, you know, it's a generational difference. Maybe that's, that's what it is. is. That's okay. it is. It's a generational difference. Um, because my parents were born in the forties, and so were mine. you didn't divorce at all. You did not divorce. Mm -hmm. You stayed there, and so as, and I think I may be ten years older than you, a little less than ten years older than you. Maybe like I said, less than ten years older. So my generation because our parents stayed we felt like we had to stay mm -hmm. um and 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 that and it wasn't until your age my younger sister's age y'all said that it was like yeah because i'm technically a millennial yeah, yeah i'm not i'm the generation before the millennials i could sit on myself in that generation <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like y'all were like no i'm good but we were like no we can't i can't leave Mm -hmm. Our identity was What's founded in, in the marriage. marriage. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we when we let go of our original identities to get married and adopted that identity, and then that's ripped from us, we're nothing. But I think also spirituality plays a, a role because I grew up in a spiritual household. And, and I don't even think I've talked about this on the show, but even when it came to um, sex, and, and learning sex like I had to tell my mom like when I got older we never discussed sex in our house just like the, you don't discuss divorce you don't talk about marriage issues and infidelities and, and abuse you don't talk about sex all I knew was that sex was a, a sex before marriage was a sin it was called considered fornication um and that Stepping outside in your marriage was adultery. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew about the sexually transmitted diseases you could could get, but there was no nothing real and tangible that I could hold on to. Like this is why we encourage you to to wait till you're married because of the emotional aspect right. or you know, mm -hmm. you begin to change in this way when somebody doesn't meet your expectations or this person is more vested in the relationship because they confuse sex with, with love. love right? You know, those those were not conversations. I had to find out those things on my own as an adult. And so I think when you look at divorce, there's so much spirituality that uh in our upbringing and mm -hmm. that also plays a role because like you said people are like well this is what the vows say mm -hmm. for better or worse for sick for for sick for sick or, or poor for no, sickness or health sick or poor i'm like hold vows. on <laughs> <laughs> but those vows yeah like you you know you're supposed to stick it out mm -hmm. and we know that grandparents and parents did that so i think it's i think it's really interesting to um to hear different perspectives i want to ask though and i've heard adrian talk about this on her podcast but for for the listeners on living the stress life i really want you to talk about what you just mentioned you were already dealing with the divorce and identity crisis like you said you had that pretty much was the only person you had been with in your adult life every part of adrian that you knew included this person right right so everybody i mean every aspect of your life was formed with this other person mm -hmm. and so you find yourself almost like in adolescence like trying to figure out who you've been and who you're becoming so let's mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit about what that process looked like for each one of you um it's still happening <laughs> <laughs> i'll tell you that because like i said it's only been two years but when it first began, I was in a tailspin, um, literally. It's like I literally lost half of myself. Mm -hmm. I did not know who I was anymore. All I knew was I was Felicia the attorney mm -hmm. and Felicia the mom. But that third aspect, Felicia the wife, was gone. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, what do I do with that part of me? I'm, so it's like I was just out there, and I knew there was something, and I knew what I, who I used to be. But it didn't fit with who I had become because now I was a mom and an attorney. I was like, well, I can't just go out and party like they do in the movies and go get <laughs> drunk and then find a strange man and bring him home. I got kids, you know, and it's like I'm not going to get on some crazy dating site and just find the next man. And, you know, we hook up. What do I do? I didn't even 
I don't know how to date <laughs> because dating has changed so much. Oh I don't know how to date. I don't know how to talk to men anymore. How long, so how long had you been married? If you don't mind uh, joking. Ooh, 2002. Okay. So 14, 15 years. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't know how to talk to men anymore. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like, hi, you know, I'm very, I'm very awkward. So yeah, I went back to, I reverted to an adolescent stage mm -hmm. where I didn't know how to talk to men. I didn't know how to, to go out and just hang out. And when a man approached me and flirted, I didn't know he was flirting with me because mm -hmm. I'm so busy in my phone or talking to my friend and my friend would say, Hey, he's flirting with you. I'm like, me? Why? Me? I've got kids. You know, <laughs> <laughs> why would a male flirt with a woman with kids? You know, so it, it, it was stressful because I knew that something had to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to realize that I had to fill that gap. Right. Me. I, that's, a, yeah. that's a key thing. And I, I was going to ask you that, and then I, we'll, we'll switch back over to you. I was going to ask you that because I think so many times, like you said, people are looking like, okay, this man is gone. I've been, I've identified myself mm -hmm. through a relationship. Mm -hmm. So what's going to feel this void? Mm -hmm. And so we immediately, I think, just innately start thinking about, okay, well, I have to, I have to have another mate. Mm -hmm. I have to be rematched, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you recognize, like, no, nah, I really might need to just figure out who I am because... First of all, if I am rematched, I want to be rematched with something that is going to be better than the first. Mm -hmm. Not to say that the first was all bad, right? But you don't want to go down. But you don't. You wanna, but you, you also want to be rematched with someone who you have become. That's true. Right? Because sometimes in divorce, you mm -hmm. separate because the two of you have gone different ways. And if you're maturing in a different way than he is, or you know he hasn't matured. You want somebody that's going to match your level of maturity or be even more mature than you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things now that I will not accept. Amen. There's things now I will not tolerate. I, I tell gentlemen that try to date me, look, this is what you're not going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I lay it out on the list. And I say, if you can't handle this, then, you know, we're good. You know, I can chip, chat with you. We can be friends. I can hit you up on Facebook every once in a while and troll and like a couple of your pictures. But that's as far <laughs> as we go. <laughs> That's what I do. I troll. <laughs> what about you, Adrian? Um, it, it was it was hard for me. I went. It was it was really fast because I had to go. So I went from being a stay at home mom for ten, eleven years to working, moving mm. out of the home that my children grew up in, and they started a new school all within like three weeks it was a lot i had not worked you know nine to five it had been years mm -hmm. i mean years so that was that was hard like i got up every morning and cried i'm like i'm in this new house by myself i have never lived alone mm -hmm. and it was like oh my god what is this and then the very first time the kids um, were gone like the weekend with their dad I had a meltdown because I was so used to either being with a spouse or my children mm -hmm. never being alone with myself so I had to learn Adrian like I had my I went to therapy like lay on a sofa it was the best thing that I could have done because he told me he was like okay this is what I want you to do I need you to find something to do now I do all this stuff I cook I, I you know sew and I like to make jewelry, just all kinds of things. I'm crafty. I love to use my hands. But it's all attached to my emotions. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not emotionally balanced, even now, I can't sew. I'm not doing anything. I'm not cooking. I'm not doing anything. I might go grab me some fast food, but I don't put the love into it, you know, that I would normally do. So he told me to start working out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to go to the gym. And he said, go, and it'll help you sleep. And it did. Mm -hmm. Like, that was... That was when I started finding Adrian. So I started, you know, kind of taking myself to the movies. I'd never done that before. Mm -hmm. I'd never gone out to eat alone. Mm -hmm. I'd never gone to, you know, a place alone. I had not gone to the art museum by myself. I've not done any of these things alone. So it's, it's, it was something. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely something. 
You know, I think it's interesting for me to hear you guys talk about this. When Mark gets annoyed because I say me a lot mm -hmm. instead of we mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, and he emphasizes when he talks about something, he'll say are or we. And even today, I was messing with my mom and I said, I'm about to move to an apartment. He said, no, she said I'm. And I just looked at him and I was like, first of all, and he's just like, why can't you say? And I was like, I think there's a part of me that's very rebellious because I've been married since a year. I mean, it wasn't even a full, was it a full year? A little over a year, 13 months after I graduated from college, Lamar and I got married. And not only did I become a mom, I became a mom, a wife, and then a mom of three. And it was just like, it all happened so fast. I became a homeowner. I became a working adult. I had all these life transitions. And my identity became, like you said, so enmeshed. And I think there were things that we were th working through in our relationship that spilled over from us being, trying to, thinking we grown, but being mm -hmm. babies going into that relationship that a part of me just never wanted to lose myself in another person. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm big about that. And, like, we used to have these arguments be because, like, he would say stuff like, you're so beautiful, and I would get pissed off. And he was like, I don't understand how you get mad about being called. I was like, you can call me smart. Why can't you call me? <laughs> and he was just like, I didn't think I had to highlight those things. I'm like, why? Why I only got to be beautiful? And he was just like, you are tripping. <laughs> but I think for me it was... He was traditional in a sense, like, he's like, let me be the man. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't need you to do everything for me. You know what I'm saying? And now I just be like, brother, can I get you, can I, can I get you to do something? True, true is a chore. True, true <laughs> something that you're going to do. And it's funny how I've transitioned, but I think even now, a huge part of me is always rebelling against this thing that I really want to know who Tiffany is. Like, I never want to lose sight of myself. I feel like I know me, the good and the bad, right? And I just never want to lose sight of this person. And so I think when I think about if me and my husband, God forbid, ever went through a divorce or he ever died and I found myself alone, I'm like, can I, even though I've been re rebelling against getting lost in this marriage, I don't think, I don't think I would know who I am and see, outside of that. I'm going to interject here because I was 19 when I got married. I didn't know who I was then. Yeah. So I immediately became, I was, a, I had my daughter when I was 18, got married the year, you know, the very next year. So I immediately became a mom and I immediately became a wife. And then I kept, I kept trying to do other things, but that's, that was the core. That's mm. all I knew. Mm. Like that is all I knew. So I'm 41, I'll be 42 this year and I'm just now learning who I am. I'm just now, I'm going to cry. I just now, I'm just now learning, you know, what I like mm -hmm. and what I don't like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I would get upset because here I am, 41, or then 38, even now, 41. And most of my age have like this big, you know, this 401k, this big savings account, you know, they have all these things. And I don't have that. And I would beat up on myself because... You know, I feel like I should be so much further along. And it took a friend of mine telling me, Adrian, you don't give yourself enough credit. Like, no. you, you, you have to look at the things that you've done and look at where you are and look at how successful your kids are. Even though, you know, like I was just saying earlier, you know, my ex-husband was like, he was so iron fist that I had to be soft like putty. And that, I didn't realize how bad it was until the divorce. I did everything for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am still teaching them, like my son, put your dishes in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I did not realize how bad. So I'm trying to reteach him years of, like, not really bad behavior, but just things I didn't teach because I felt like I was a stay-at-home mom. So it was my job to do everything. I think it's even deeper than that, Adrian, because... Um, I don't cook as much. I, I mentioned that I hate cooking, right? So <laughs> I don't cook as much anymore. But when my kids were younger, I was a stay at home mom. Uh, and me and my husband actually were not in agreement necessarily about that. But in my mind, in order for me to be a good wife and to be a good mom, I had to be present. I had to cook for them. 
And at one point when my kids were going to school, I was literally getting up and cooking them breakfast and hot lunch. I was making spaghetti, beef tips and rice. And, <laughs> and, and I'm talking about like, and I hate cooking. I absolutely hate it. Like when I go in my kitchen, I'll be like, I need a chef. I ain't rich enough because <laughs> this is, I'm not about this life. But in, there's a part of me too that would resent having to do those things because I care so much. But my love language is acts of service. Mm -hmm. And so my my act of service or my, my declaration of love to my family was to wait on them, hands and foot. I mean, I remember my mom coming over and I was like, excuse the house. And she was like, is the home inspector coming? <laughs> and, and, you know, it was really bad, you know. And then when it finally set in, my husband was like, listen, you taking your mama advice to look like, can we clean up? Because I went the complete opposite direction but it was like I'm not I'm struggling to find balance and like you said you were doing everything for them and now that they're older you're like I need to show y'all this is not what it's all about but I think a lot of it has to do with too we're trying to show how much we love mm -hmm. if your husband had an iron fist and you had to be putty you also had to demonstrate that you're vested like I can cook for you I can clean for you I can I can make you happy you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt. I felt like in my mind to be a good mom and to be a good wife and for my kids to know that I cared, I had to do all that stuff. I was at every PTA meeting. Every I was at PTA. every, like, I was a classroom parent and working and going to school. Um, and at one point, I wasn't really working. I was just going to school. But I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. tapped out. I hated being a stay-at-home mom. I absolutely hated it. And now I regret that because I was like, I really wished I could have been in a different space because I did all those things, but there was no joy there. Mm -hmm. There was love, but there was no joy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I just think it's really interesting, your perspective and your experience on that. What, what about you? Funny, but our stories are similar. Um, I got married at 25, I think. Don't remember. <laughs> no. I think it was 25. And um, I was already pregnant when I got married. Um, I lost that child, so we went into the marriage losing a baby. Um, not six months later, I got pregnant with my oldest. So we never had that period of time to really learn each other. We we dated in high school. So we, we had literally been together for over 30 years. Mm-hmm because we were high school sweethearts. We dated off and on while I was in high school and college. And then I moved back home, started teaching. We started dating again. We got married, I moved to Kentucky. Moved away from my family. Went up there, was already pregnant, lost a baby. Six months later, had a baby. So it was not like we had this wonderful time where we were able to learn how to be husband and wife. Mm -hmm. I, at 25, you still don't know yourself, mm -hmm. okay? And so here I am thinking I'm grown, I'm 25. I got a job, I got this husband, and we got a house. I know what I'm doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm 42, about to be 43. Um, but what what happened in that transition, and, and I don't mind telling this, what destroyed my marriage was communication. Mm -hmm. And I say that because at the beginning of the marriage, we never learned how to communicate. It was always, we talked to one another but we didn't communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. I would hear what he would say, and then I'd be like, well, I'm not going to do that, because that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. And then I went the complete opposite direction, kind of like you, and I was like, well, I'm going to be this wonderful, submissive wife, because I'm going to show him that I can be this great wife. Mm -hmm. That didn't work. And then finally, after at some point, it was like, you know what? I can't keep faking, because I started getting upset. Mm -hmm. It's like, coming home and I'm pretending to be a wife and enjoying this mm. and it was like this, this sucks mm. this it was literally sucking the life out of me I began to resent my kids I began to resent my marriage and I tried to make it work I really did it was a lot of questioning like you know what can I do to make this better I tried to start the communication process and it didn't happen and then it's like you know what I can't keep doing this I've done this for too many years and I don't think that we're going to make it much longer. I don't think we're about to make it another month. Mm -hmm. um, and after we got divorced, at first it was kind of like, it's, it's a death. It's literally a death. And it was almost like, 
Oh my God, because you go through stages of grief. And it was almost like, oh my God, this has to happen. I'm not divorced. That's, you know, that's not what they really want. He's going to come back in the 60 days and say, you know, baby, I love you. Let's get back together. I really need you. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, maybe in a month he'll do that. Well, maybe in two months he'll do that. And it never happened. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, okay, what do we do? What do I do? Because I kept saying we. I was like, what, what do I do at this point? Then I dove into the kids. But in diving into kids, I never dealt with the emotional issue that I had. It wasn't until, now I'm about to cry. See? <laughs> it wasn't until um, about a month or two months ago, I was sitting in Revelator with a friend of mine. And I'll give him a shout out if he's listening. It's Tavares Cook. I love him to death. And he said to me, Felicia, you've got to forgive him and forgive yourself for whatever you did to destroy your marriage. Mm. And I fought with him. Yeah. And I said, as far as I didn't do anything to ruin my marriage, I didn't do it. I, you know, I was a great wife. He said, Felicia, stop lying. He said, you were a part of the divorce. So there was something that you did to destroy the marriage. And when I got out of my car, I just sat there. I couldn't crank it. I couldn't do anything because I could not see because I was bawling. And I screamed so loud in my car. And I said, oh God, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Because I realized I'd been lying to myself. Mm -hmm. And so after after that, that, that moment of clarity and realizing that I've been walking around with this cloud over my head, pretending like I'm this great, wonderful, upstanding person, putting myself on a pedestal, when literally I did as much as he did to destroy the marriage, <coughs> it, it made me realize, okay, it's time for you to find yourself. So it, it I mean, when I said my, my, my finding myself is just happening, it's really just happening because I walked around for so long angry. I would look at him and say, I wish he would drop dead or get hit by a garbage truck. Mm. You know, I was so angry at him, but I had to learn to forgive myself first, to forgive him so that I would be able to move forward and, and find me. And, and you, you talk about forgiveness. Forgiving, it's, that's for you anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for me. It's for you anyway. Because I, I did go to him and say I apologize. And he was like, for what? I said, for whatever I've done. And he was like, mm, yeah, okay. But it, it was for me. Mm -hmm. It was more for myself, saying, making sure that it's almost like a 12-step program where I had to say it just to get it out so that I don't carry any guilt over what happened in our relationship. Because I, I, I feel like I failed. Mm -hmm. I feel like a failure because I did not um, make my marriage last. But I think that is the thing, and that's what I want to point out. I've heard so many people say that, that they feel like they failed and that they come to a point where they're struggling with anger and that anger after you break it down and dissect it it's not even about the other person mm -hmm. it's a it's what yourself you right? yourself and you know i think it's so interesting because i've i've seen me and lamar like we don't have a perfect marriage we work really hard at our marriage and i promise you we are like oil and water i'm like honestly we just been celebrating 14 years i do not know how in the hell we have made it 14 <laughs> years I'm, I'm i'm serious because if I say left, he say right. If I say, all right, let's go right, he said, no, nah, we're going to go left. And I just be like, nigga, <laughs> like, <laughs> what we going to do? You know what I'm saying? And so I think that in that, th there's all this anger. There's all this resentment. But a lot of times, the person you really be upset is because you're mad when you're resistant. Like you said, you're mad when you won't go with the flow. And then you mad when you try to to get yourself together and be like, be submissive, be this white. And then you feel like you become a stepping stool. It's like you never find that balance. So I think it's interesting that you said that because that's the recurring theme I'm hearing when I hear people talk about going through divorce is the, it's the feeling of failure and the feeling of anger. And it, it, it seems like it's, pro, um, it, it's projected towards the other person. But when you break it down, you be mad at yourself. You know what somebody told me? He said, what is considered a successful marriage? Staying married 78 years and putting up with all kinds of crap? And what's considered, it, why, why is a marriage considered a failure if you divorce? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a failure. Look at this, because 
when you look at it, a marriage is not all bad. You know, no matter who you're married to, it's not all bad. There no. were, and I won't ever say that. You know, we had good times and then we had not so good times. But, you know, what he told me was like, you know, y'all were married almost 20 years. Y'all made it successfully. You know, you raised your kids, you got your kids up, you did all these things. So, you know, you have to look at that. That doesn't mean it's a failure. And him telling me that was right. Oh, okay. I, I didn't fail. I didn't fail. It was successful because... I I say it was successful because we I don't know how to I don't know how to phrase it. It's like it wasn't necessarily a failure. It was just a closed chapter. I mean like we, you know, grew apart, all these things happened and then you move on with life. And it probably had a lot to do with the fact that you say you guys were babies. Yeah. Y'all were babies trying to raise babies. Mm -hmm. And then we already know, we think we grown when we 18, 19, mm-hmm. we doing grown folk stuff, but then you realize you have not yet reached the point where you know yourself. And honestly, I really true, like, truly feel like we never get to a point where we truly know who we are. I think we can get, like, we low 85%. I think that's about the highest, <laughs> because you're always changing. It's, it's new always experiences, evolving. new information makes you change, right? It causes you to evolve. So, I think if if I understand what you're saying, you guys were successful because you you created some things in that relationship right. and accomplished some things right. in that mm-hmm. relationship that were not all bad. Right. You created three beautiful children. Mm-hmm. That ain't that ain't like you say. You can get to a point where you resent your children, but you only resent them because you might have felt like you were not in the right space. But when you realize I'm not mad at these kids, like I will literally kill somebody behind these mm-hmm. kids mm-hmm. you realize that you just resented the space you were in at the time you yeah. know what i'm saying i i think that for me looking at other people's relationships and hearing people talk about divorce it's hard for me to really imagine what that feels like you know it's like like i've never experienced a lot of death I talked about, well, I haven't really gotten into this, but this is something we are going to talk about on the podcast about, like, me losing my father two years ago. Mm -hmm. And, man, I feel like I'm going to (laughs) cry. The process of preparing for losing my father because of all the stuff that I was holding on, all the baggage from that relationship. And my dad died slowly. You know, it just it's not like he just had a heart attack or something. I watched him change and slip mm-hmm. away, right? And I think the same thing happens with divorce. Like you said, it's a death. You mm-hmm. see it changing. You see it happening. But it's like at the same time, it's not real. And then mm-hmm. you realize it's gone. It's dead. And then you grieve, right? Mm-hmm. And so... And that grief is not always immediate. No, no. And I think for me, being the person I am, being type A being a therapist, being the sibling that I am and my and how I see myself in, in family order. I'm not going to even get into all that psychotherapeutic stuff. I started telling myself when I realized my dad was going downhill, you need to grieve now. Mm-hmm. Like I was I would allow myself to cry. I would be coaching myself, but when it happened, I just remember sitting there like what the hell? Like I was just numb. And so if I, when I imagine people talking about divorce, I don't I don't have anything to pull from. But if I likened it to to that experience, mm-hmm. I think I can identify. Yeah. But I still, it's you still don't know till you're in it, right? Right. And and then you don't know how it's gonna process. Yeah. You may grieve and get angry. You may get angry, then grieve, and then become resilient. You may be resilient. And then cry a little bit, and then you get angry a little bit, then you're resilient. I mean, there's no set pattern at all. And, and, and when you go to kids, to sprinkle in the kids yeah, and all that right. stuff. And then yeah. and then you cycle through it. You do, because something will happen. Um, you know, an event will pass, or your anniversary come up, and then you're thinking about it, and subconsciously you're like, oh, it's our anniversary. No, it's not. We're divorced. Mm. You know? It's, subconsciously, those things take you back through there, or you you may be near them, and you laugh, 
you know, and it brings back just a moment, a brief moment of how it used to be. And then you're just immediately reminded, oh, this isn't real. Right. This is just a moment. You know, so you cycle through all of those emotions until you get to the point where when it comes up, just like after you've dealt with death, it may burn a little, but then you're like, I'm okay. okay. Right. Hmm. And then it just, it happens at like the oddest time. Oh, I remember, I, I got, I purchased a house in, I don't know, that's how it's <laughs> Anyway, I was walking around the back of the house, like picking up trash. And when I tell you, I, I had this, I literally fell out in my yard, just like collapsed on my knees. Mm. And it was like, and I think that was, <laughs> I will not. Okay. That it, okay. that was my moment, like mm. when it was, like you know it's over, and like I hadn't yet moved into this house, so I, I'm trying to even think of, think of the date, and I can't even remember, but I, that was my moment where it was like, okay, and and I, I exhale, yes, and 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 I was I was good. I haven't had, you know, any type of. I, I hold no resentment. I, there is no bitterness. There is no no hatred. I've told my children, you know, hey, this is his wife. You need to respect her. When they married, I put her on, you know, the stuff at the school because, okay, if you need to go get my son, this is what you need to do. So mm -hmm. there's no resentment. Um, you need to respect her. You need to respect your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, I've taught them this, you know, and it was, they look at me like, uh, mama, why? Well, why are you being like this? There's no reason for me to be angry. Mm -hmm. You know what? Until you just said that, I don't think I ever processed what waiting to exhale actually meant. That's, the movie, mm -hmm. like I saw the movie. Yeah. I mm -hmm. remember all the details, and I, and you understand the storyline. But until you said that moment, it's like you reached a point. I can like I can visualize that getting to your knees, where it's just like it is what it is. Like I'm here. And I'm actually okay. Like, I can breathe. When I got up off that ground, knees dirty <laughs> and all, you know, I was I was good. It was like, I am okay. Mm. And I've been I've been fine since. What about you? Have you had your... Are you still waiting to exhale or have you had your That's moment? a good question. Um, I know I had the breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally breakdown. But I'm getting to that waiting to exhale moment. Girl, I don't know if I'm going to cry again, but I'm getting to the point where I'm okay. I'm I can until the orgasm. I think for so. I hope it's good for me. It's like an emotional <laughs> orgasm it's because wonderful. you peak and then it's just like hmm, you and, yeah. and I'm serious. That was the it spot was, right there. Yeah. It was and it's, and that's what it was like because you you go through all of this hurt and all of this change that's so quick that you have to find a way to adapt to. Mm. And it is hard. It is so hard, but nobody talks about that. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about that. It's hard. It ain't nothing easy. There is nothing easy about divorce. Nothing. But when you get to that point where it's like, okay. Mm. It is what it is. <laughs> and then you and then you go forward. Yeah. So this is what we're gonna do now. We're going to transition to tips of the day. Okay, so I want to give people a takeaway. Y'all ready to talk about tips of the day? Let's go. Let's do it. All right. So I gotta add another line here. I'm gonna ask you a. I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. Okay. Fine. <laughs> give me just. Can I take my cup away? Look, I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. Oh my! That's what kept me from crying because I was like, just drink your water. <laughs> I'm, like I said, I'm a troller. I follow oh, you. Oh, so you already know who I Yes. I don't know I have, you. I have followed See? you for a year because you did a skirt a year back or two years back that I fell in love with. Skirt. It was a pink skirt that was mid length and it was kind of like an A line skirt. It was cute. My money ain't right just yet to make custom, <laughs> but when I get there, oh, I'm going to tell so you, cute. my thing is I love jumpsuits and ruffers, and I am into a lot of. Uh, African prints. When I tell you at work, they be getting all this black girl magic. I used to not do that, right? You but did. I, I didn't. You I did. was very conservative, but 
these days, and I'm telling you, I'll be like, y'all tried it, and I go to work with, like, huge <laughs> earrings. <laughs> I had on a head wrap two weeks ago, and I was like, y'all gonna get all this. And they be like, you look so pretty. I'll be like, mm, thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm glad Recognize. you appreciate this culture. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, I'm not figure out what skirt this is. I don't know. I, I want to say it was hot, but it was a... She's gonna find the skirt. Yes. Cause I, I, can, I know, cause I remember outfits. Mm-hmm. So I it's remember like how blue pink. jean jacket was it? And which is I remember that. I don't. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Was it the glitter? Was it a glitter skirt? All I know. What she said, pink. The, that's what I was thinking. Secret. It was a bad skirt. I was like, oh, I love that. I'm fine. You had a blue see. jean jacket with it, and. Or it may have been two different outfits. All I know is I fell in love with you and I started following you. You did an Ankara skirt that I fell in love with. And it's just, I like, I, when I see you pop up, I'm like, yes. Like, and then I scroll. <laughs> That's all I do. <laughs> oh, girl. All right, all right. Let me see. Let me go to Oh, see, that's like my person. See, I never know. Who is who is on my per- on this page mm-hmm. because it started off as business and then I had to kind of shut stuff down. That's I had to shut the, the personal personal things down. This had all has always been business except you know for like just a few things here and there. But yeah, this is on this page. But this is the one. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yep, no, keep moving. That is so funny. I cannot wait to see my dress again. All right, I'm start recording. Okay, go. And you because I'm still recording. Perusing. Okay, and I'm not editing any of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tips of the day. So, ladies, I think what I would like for people to take away, if you had to give any advice um, for people who are, for one, contemplating divorce, they find themselves at a point where they're actually saying, I think I'm going to do this. What do you suggest when they get to that point where they're saying, I think I'm going to do this? How do you suggest that they... For one, process that, and then once they go through that process of actually initiating divorce, and I won't even just, I won't make this just um, exclusive to women. I'm going to say men too, right? I think we shared very uh, feminine experience, perspective, right? perspectives of divorce, but even if it's a if it's a man, once you reach that point where you're initiating that process, what do you suggest they do to help them get through that? Just the initial stages of I want to divorce? Well, for one, I want to divorce, and then once they actually are going through that process. Um, for me... I, I I love love. I love marriage. And I feel like you need to make sure, look within yourself. Nobody knows you like you. You look within yourself and make sure that you have done everything that you can. Mm-hmm. Like, unless it's some type of, of, of abuse and there's, you know, because people always talk about cheating. Like, ooh, ain't no, mm-mm. But you never know until you're in it. Yeah. And I think you need to look within yourself and make sure that you know for sure for sure that you have done everything that you can you know and it's hard to it's hard to do everything you can when you have someone else who's not trying to do the work as well Mm -hmm. that's enough that's like you can't you can't do it by yourself Mm -hmm. so i say make sure you've done everything you can and once you start going through that process don't do it alone Mm. you know trying to well this is my business i'm gonna keep it to myself I think you need to find someone that is wise. You know, stay away from the bitter people who are divorced. Um, stay away from, stay away from them. Stay away from people who are going to bash. You need somebody who is going to listen to you. You need somebody who is going to tell you the truth about yourself. Because when you're going through, sometimes you can't, it's hard to see yourself. It's hard to see what you're doing. So just make sure you have a good support system that's going to call you out on your mess mm. and not just be, you know, this little amen corner. That's that's I, I, that's it. That's what I got. What about you, Dan? Ask the question again. I'm sorry. She's still looking for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So my first question is, when you have, what advice would you give a person who is in the contemplation stage where they feel like this is what they want to do? What do you advise them to do? And then secondly, if they find themselves 
in that in the the next stage where they've actually initiated a another divorce a divorce and they're actually going through it what do you advise them to do to really help them get through that process um i'm gonna come at this two ways okay okay the first way i'm gonna come at it is as a lawyer if you're contemplating getting a divorce i do recommend that you go talk to an attorney i really do um because there's so much that you don't think about uh -huh. when you're going through a divorce um i have witnessed divorces where people have fought over dogs who you know the dog had visitation rights because what? mommy wanted the dog and daddy wanted the dog and i need the dog because i you know he's been my companion for 15 years well i need the dog because he's in my emotional sp i have watched divorces that have done that i've watched divorces where there was a fight over the house and <laughs> She had to leave the house. So in the process of leaving the house, she strips the house of light fixtures, of the switches, and takes the grates up from the air ducts. Ooh. Yes. So there's a lot you need to discuss, and you need to go to an attorney. Because they will advise you, as the neutral person, you know, these are the possible outcomes. Um, secondly, as a person who's been through divorce, if this is what you want to do, Find somebody. I'm going to reiterate this and jump on that bandwagon too. Find somebody you can talk to, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a friend that you can trust, whether it's a random person on the street that you just find somebody you can talk to and say, look, I'm thinking about getting a divorce and literally lay it out on the line. You have to bear your soul and lay it out on the line. And you have to consider, does the bad outweigh the good? You really do. Because, yeah, there, all marriages aren't perfect. All marriages don't go, stay hunky-dory and Cinderella-like. You know, right. you're going to have bad moments. So is this just a bad moment? Or is this so bad? Has it crossed a line that you can't return from? Now, if somebody's already in a divorce, once again... Please go see your lawyer. <laughs> Do not try to fight a divorce by yourself nope. because you're not going to get what you think. As an attorney that has gone up against somebody who didn't have an attorney, I raped them mm -hmm. on purpose because I'm like, if you're too stupid to get a lawyer, oh, I'm going to take your pants too at the court mm -hmm. and you're going to have me give me your pants and your shoes. Mm. So I'm going to need them to consider, even if they don't hire a lawyer, consult a lawyer about a divorce. Because there may be a way you can do your divorce without having to go to court and just submit the papers. Or it may require you to go to court so that you can get the equity out of the house. Because as a single mom that will stay home, guess what? You have equity in the home, though you did not work. You have value. And a lot of women don't know that. A lot of men that don't know that, that they're stay-at-home dads. Um, as a person who's gone through divorce, once again, I go back to find somebody you can trust. And be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Recognize what what you did and didn't do. Be okay with it. Humble yourself. Mm -hmm. Know know that this is about to be a a tricky and sticky situation that you're going through. If you have children, be as upfront and honest with them as you possibly can, without telling them the dirty details. Right. Because I think sometimes that that messes up kids too. Mm -hmm. um, be as honest with yourself, be as honest with your kids, and be upfront and honest with your with your future ex. At the end of the day, this makes or breaks a marriage and it'll make or break a divorce. Communicate. Communicate with, with him or her. Communicate with your kids. Communicate with your attorney. And communicate with yourself. Meditate, pray, talk to God, or whatever you believe in. But you need to communicate because if you don't, you're holding all that in. And it's going to bring you down. It'll really bring you down. And it'll take a while for you to get back up. Y'all had some awesome tips. I don't have nothing to add because, first of all, I ain't been through a divorce. So I'm going to pretend like I have a tip. So I'm going to leave that to the ladies who've experienced it. I thank everybody for tuning in. Until next time, live your best life. Living through your stress life. Holla!